I'm Mary Shelley. I am the author of Frankenstein, the inventor of science fiction. I am frequently called a goth queen for losing my virginity on my mother's grave and for writing this book about the horrors of monsters and existence. And today I am reading from Frankenstein, letter four, to Mrs. Seville, England, August 5th. 17th century. So strange an accident has happened to us that I cannot forbear recording it, although it is very probable that you will see me before these papers can come into your possession. Last Monday, July 31st, we were nearly surrounded by ice, which closed in the ship on all sides, scarcely leaving her the sea room in which she floated. Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were compassed round by very thick fog. We accordingly lay to, hoping that some change would take place in the atmosphere and weather. About two o'clock the mist cleared away, and we beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice, which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned, and my own mind began to grow watchful with anxious thoughts, when a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention, and diverted our solicitude from our own situation. We perceived a low carriage fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs, pass on toward the north, at the distance of half a mile, a being which had the shape of a man, but apparently of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge and guided by the dogs. We watched the rapid progress of the traveller with our telescopes until he was lost among the distant inequalities of the ice. This appearance excited our unqualified wonder, we were, as we believed, many hundred miles away from any land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not in reality so distant as we had supposed. Shut in, however, by ice, it was impossible to follow his track, which we had observed with the greatest attention. About two hours after this occurrence we heard the ground sea, and before night the ice broke and freed our ship. We, however, lay in two until the morning, fearing to encounter in the dark those large, loose masses which float about after the breaking up of the ice. I profited of this time to rest for a few hours. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went upon deck and found all the sailors busy on one side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sledge, like that which we had seen before, which had drifted towards us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive, but there was a human being within it whom the sailors were persuading to enter the vessel. He was not, as the other traveller seemed to be, a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered land, but a European. When I appeared on deck, the master said, Here is our captain, and he will not allow you to perish on the open sea. On perceiving me, the stranger addressed me in English, although, he, although with a foreign accent. Before I come on board your vessel, said he, will you have the kindness to inform me whither you are bound? You may conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction, and to whom I should have supposed that my vessel would have been a resource which he could would have not have exchanged for the most precious wealth the earth can afford. I replied, however, that we were on a voyage of discovery toward the North Pole. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. Good God, Margaret, if you had seen the man who thus capitulated for his safety, your surprise would have been boundless. His limbs were nearly frozen, and his body dreadfully emaciated by fatigue and suffering. I never saw a man in so wretched a condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the air, he fainted. We accordingly brought him back to the deck and restored him to animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to swallow a small quantity. As soon as he showed signs of life, we wrapped him up in blankets and placed him near the chimney of the kitchen stove. By slow degrees, he recovered and ate a little soup, which restored him wonderfully. Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak, and I often feared that his sufferings had deprived him of understanding. When he had in some measure recovered, I removed him to my own cabin and attended on him as much as my duty would permit. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness and even madness. But there are moments when, if anyone performs an act of kindness towards him or does him any the most trifling service, his whole countenance is lighted up, as it were with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equaled. 
but he is generally melancholy and despairing, and sometimes he gnashes his teeth, as if impatient of the weight of woes that oppresses him. When my guest was a little recovered, I had great trouble to keep off the men who wished to ask him a thousand questions, but I would not allow him to be tormented by their idle curiosity, in a state of body and mind whose restoration evidently depended upon entire repose. Once, however, the lieutenant asked why he had come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom, and he replied, To seek one who fled from me. And did the man whom you pursued travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him, for the day before we picked you up, we saw some dogs drawing a sledge with a man in it across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions concerning the route which the demon, as he called him, had pursued. Soon after, when he was alone with me, he said, I have doubtless excited your curiosity as well as that of this good people, but you are too considerate to make inquiries. Certainly, it would indeed be very impertinent and inhuman of me to trouble you with any inquisitiveness of mine. And yet you rescued me from a strange and perilous situation. You have benevolently restored me to life. Soon after this, he inquired if I thought that the breaking up of the ice had destroyed the other sledge. I replied that I could not answer with any degree of certainty, for the ice had not broken until near midnight, and the traveler might have arrived at a place of safety before that time, but of this I could not judge. From this time, a new spirit of life animated the decaying frame of the stranger. He manifested the greatest eagerness to be upon deck to watch for the sledge, which had before appeared. But I have persuaded him to remain in the cabin, for he is far too weak to sustain the rawness of the atmosphere. I have promised that someone should watch for him and give him instant notice if any new object should appear in sight. Such is my journal of what relates to the strange occurrence up to the present day. The stranger has gradually improved in health, but is very silent and appears uneasy when anyone except myself enters his cabin. Yet his manners are so conciliating and gentle that the sailors are all interested in him, although they have had very little communication with him. For my own part, I begin to love him as a brother, and his constant and deep grief fills me with sympathy and compassion. He must have been a noble creature in his better days, being even now in wreck so attractive and amiable." I said in one of my letters, my dear Margaret, that I should find no friend on the wide ocean, yet I have found a man who, before his spirit had been broken by misery, I should have been happy to have possessed as the brother of my heart. I shall continue my journal concerning the stranger at intervals, should I have any fresh incidents to record. And with that time the spirit must depart. Be well. Greetings, greetings, authors of future days. My name is Jane C. Webb Loudon, Mrs. I was born in 1807, but even with the advanced science of the 19th century, I succumbed to illness and became a spirit in 1858. The mysterious forces that drew me to your gathering say, you long to connect with your ancestresses in the telling of fantastical tales. Ah, uh, but I must humbly admit that my scientific fiction novel, The Mummy, which I wrote as a teenager, much like Mary Shelley, my heroine, was both my first and last adventure in such writings. And yet, that is the book that brought me fame. A certain reader posted, that is the manner in which one speaks these days, yes? A review of the book in his magazine about gardening. He loved my book. And when we came to meet, I discovered a similar emotion in my heart. And together thereafter, we explored the universe of horticulture. I, I'm rather awfully well known as one who brought the science of horticulture into the hands of women such as myself. Yet, I've always been terribly pleased with the inventions I devised for the mummy. In the spirit world, we have many lively conversations on it. Let me read a bit of it for you here. I'm even, can you tell, I'm attempting the charming American accent that I've heard so much of today. So here we are in chapter four, Sir Ambrose awaits in great tremulosity to hear news of his dear son, Edmund, who has been away at war and has yet to meet the fearsome mummy, 
His dear old friend, the Duke, has just arrived in his fabulous aerial balloon transport. What I most love in this passage are the various inventions my youthful mind concocted to enhance the lives of people of the 22nd century. Chapter 4. The Duke and Sir Ambrose were always glad to meet, but as the present occasion was one of more than ordinary interest, so they now greeted each other with more than ordinary pleasure. The Duke had always been warmly attached to Edmund, Sir Ambrose's son, and his voice actually trembled with agitation as he exclaimed, Well, my old friend, you see your brave boy is determined to keep us alive still. Our blood would stagnate in our veins if he didn't give us a fillip now and then to rouse us. But what does the young rogue say of himself? I hope he's not wounded. He never mentions himself, replied Sir Ambrose, tears glistening in his eyes as he pressed the hand of his friend warmly in his own. Edmund loves his country too devotedly to think either of peril or reward in her service. But he shall have a reward, cried the Duke, laughing. Aye, and a fitting one too, eh, Elvira? What say you? His daughter, Elvira, blushed, smiled, and looked down, as young ladies generally do upon such occasions, while Sir Ambrose, who had now reached the summit of the telegraph mount, was too eagerly looking round in every direction to even hear his friend's remark. In those days, the ancient method of conveying the post, having been found much too slow for so enlightened a people, an ingenious scheme had been devised by which the letters were put into balls and discharged by steam cannon from place to place, every town and district having a piece of toile metallique or woven wire suspended in the air so as to form a kind of net to arrest the progress of the ball and being provided with a cannon to send it off again when the letters belonging to that neighborhood should have been extracted. Whilst, to prevent accidents, the mail post letter balls were always preceded by one of a similar description, made of thin wood with a hole in the side, which, collecting the wind as it passed along, made a kind of whizzing noise to admonish people to keep out of the way. The mount on which Sir Ambrose now stood commanded an extensive view, and the scene it presented was beautiful in the extreme. On one side, innumerable grass fields, richly wooded and only divided from each other by invisible iron fences, appeared like one vast park, whilst on the other, the waving corn, its full heads beginning to darken in the sun, gave a rich glowing tint to the landscape. But Sir Ambrose thought not of the prospect, he thought only of the small black spot he had just discovered at the edge of the horizon. In breathless anxiety, his eyes almost starting from their sockets, he bent eagerly forwards, gazing on this small and at first almost imperceptible speck. It gradually grew larger and larger. It rapidly approached, and in a few seconds, a slight noise buzzed through the air as the long-expected balls whizzed past him. Sir Ambrose's agitation was extreme. With trembling limbs and livid lips, he hurried to the nearest telegraph station, which luckily was close at hand, and round which several of his household were assembled in their impatience to hear the news. Sir Ambrose could not speak, but the person whose province it was to sort the letters guessed his errand, and opening the bag held forth the ardently expected treasure. Gasping for breath, Sir Ambrose eagerly attempted to take it, but his hands were unequal to the task. The violence of his emotion overpowered him, and after a short but fruitless struggle, he fell senseless to the ground. The confusion produced by this unexpected incident was indescribable. The old duke walked up and down, wringing his hands and exclaiming, What shall we do? What will become of us? Whilst the rest of the party endeavored to give assistance to Sir Ambrose. Parental affection, said Davis, who had an unfortunate propensity for making long speeches, precisely at the moment when nobody was likely to attend to him. Parental affection has been universally allowed by all writers, both ancient and modern, to be one of the strongest passions of the soul, and the most exalted instances might be produced of the surprising energy of this universal sentiment. 
For heaven's sake, help me to raise my father, cried Edric. Give him air, or he'll die. Patience, continued Davis, is necessary in all things and is perhaps one of the most useful and estimable qualities of life. It enables us to bear without shrinking the bitterest evils that can assail us. Without patience, philosophy would never have made these wonderful discoveries that subjugate nature to our yoke. Fetch me some water, exclaimed Edric, or he will expire before our eyes. It appears to me said a laborer who had been mending a steam digging machine in a neighboring field and who now stood leaning upon his work and looking on gravely at all that passed without attempting to offer the least assistance, it appears to me that it would be highly improbable to administer the aqueous fluid in its natural state of frigidity under the existing circumstances. The present suspension of animation under which Sir Ambrose labors is evidently occasioned by want of circulation. Now, as it is the property of hot liquors rather than cold ones to supply the stimulant necessary for the reproduction of circulation, I opine that hot water would answer the purpose better than cold. In the meantime, Father Morris brought some water from a neighboring fountain, and throwing it on the patient's face, Sir Ambrose opened his eyes. For some moments, he stared wildly around him, but as soon as he began to recollect what had passed, he implored Father Morris to give him his ardently desired letter. Ah, and I'm told by modern spirits that my book lives on, that it is beloved of the Amazons, fiercest of women readers, and that the inventor of the printing press, Herr Gutenberg, now haunts a realm of your web where books of the past may be perused by living persons of your day, so I will depart from you to tend my garden in the land of spirits and to dream of mummies and steam digging machinery and air oil post. Oh, and remember, if you review the books you read, it may bring you true love and lifelong passion. Ooh. a lot of sort of sarcastic um, satirical pieces that appeared in the Atlantic and the New Yorker. But I did have two pieces that would be classified as science fiction. Now, one of those is called Zaritsky's Law, which you can actually find on Project Gutenberg. And the other story is called Captive Audience. Um, and it has been republished for the first time in English since 1977 in an anthology called Rediscovery, Science Fiction by Women, Volume 2, that's come out recently from Journeys Press. And I'd love to share a little bit from this story with you all uh, today with my limited time here on Earth. I think, personally, as the author of this story, that this story is as seminal today as it was when I wrote it uh, in 1953, uh, where it appeared in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. All right, this is from Captive Audience. Mavis Bascom read the letter hastily and passed it across the breakfast table to her husband, Fred, who read the first paragraph and exclaimed, she'll be here this afternoon. But neither Mavis nor the children heard him because the cereal box was going boom, boom so loudly. Presently, it stopped and the bread said urgently, one good slice deserves another. How about another slice all around, eh, mother? Mavis put four slices into the toaster, and then there was a brief silence. Fred wanted to discuss the impending visit, but his daughter Kitty got in ahead of him, saying, Mom, it's my turn to choose the next cereal, and this shot from a cannon stuff is almost gone. Will you take me to the store this afternoon? Yes, dear, of course. I must admit I'll be glad when the box is gone. Boom, 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 that's all it ever says. And some of the others have such nice songs and jingles. I don't see why ever you picked it, Billy. Billy was about to answer when his father's cigarette package interrupted. Yes, sir. Time to light up a Chesterfield. Time to enjoy that first mild, satisfying smoke of the day. Fred lit a cigarette and said angrily, Mavis, you know I don't like you to say such things in front of the children. It's a perfectly good commercial, and when you cast reflections on one, you're undermining all of them. 
I won't have you confusing these kids. I'm sorry, Fred, was all Mavis had time to say, because the salt box began a long and technically very interesting talk on iodization. Since Fred had to leave for the office before the talk was over, he telephoned back to Mavis about her grandmother's visit. Mavis, he said, she can't stay with us. You'll have to get her out just as soon as possible. All right, Fred, I don't think she'll stay very long anyway. You know she doesn't like visiting us any more than you like having her. Well, the quicker she goes, the better. If anybody down here finds out about her, I'll be washed up with the MV the same day. Yes, Fred, I know. I'll do the best I can. Fred had been with the Master Ventriloquism Corporation of America for 15 years. His work had been exceptional in every respect, and unless word leaked out about Mavis's grandmother, he could expect to remain with it for the rest of his life. He had enjoyed every step of the way from office boy to his present position as assistant vice president in charge of sales, though he sometimes wished he could have gone into the technical end of it. Fascinating, those huge batteries of machines pouring out their messages to the American people. It seemed to him almost miraculous the way the commercials were broadcast into thin air and picked up by the tiny discs embedded in the bottle or can or box or whatever wrapping contained the product but he knew it involved some sort of electronic process that he couldn't understand. Such an incredibly complex process, yet unfailingly accurate. He had never heard of the machines making a mistake. Never, for instance, had they thrown a shoe polish commercial so that it came out of a hair tonic bottle. Intrigued though he was by the mechanical intricacies of master ventriloquism, however, he had no head for that sort of thing and was content to make his contribution in the sales end. And quite a contribution it was. Already in the two short years since his promotion to assistant vice president, he had signed up two of the toughest clients that had ever been brought into the MV camp. First had been the telephone company, now one of the fattest accounts on the corporation's books. They had held out against MV for years until he, Fred, hit upon the idea that sold them. A simple message to come from every telephone at 15-minute intervals throughout the MV broadcasting day, reminding people to look in the directory before dialing information. After the telephone company coup, Fred became known around the corporation as a man to watch. He hadn't rested on his laurels. He had, if anything, topped his telephone performance. MV had pretty much given up hope of selling its services to the dignified, the conservative New York Times. But Fred went ahead and did it. He'd kept the details a secret from Mavis. She'd see it for the first time tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? Damn. Grandmother would be here. You could bet she'd make some crack and spoil the whole thing. Fred honestly didn't know if he would have gone ahead and married Mavis if he'd known about her grandmother. For the sad fact of the matter was that grandmother had never adjusted to MV. She was the only person he and Mavis knew who still longed for the good old days, as she called them, the days before MV and she yapped about them ad nauseum. She and her, a man's home is his castle. If he'd heard her say it once, he'd heard her say it 500 times. Unfortunately, it wasn't just that grandmother was a boring old fool who refused to keep up with the times. The sadder fact of the matter was that she had broken the law and today was finishing a five-year prison term. Did any other man here at MV have such a cross to bear? Again and again, he and Mavis had warned grandmother that her advanced years would not keep her from being clapped into jail, and they hadn't. She'd gone absolutely wild on the day the Supreme Court had handed down the earplug decision. It was the climax of a long and terribly costly fight by the MV Corporation. The sale of earplugs had grown rapidly during the years MV was expanding, and just at a peak period when MV had over 3,000 accounts, National Earplug Associates, Inc., had boldly staged a countrywide campaign advertising earplugs as the last defense against MV. The success of the campaign was such that the Master Ventriloquism Corporation found itself losing hundreds of accounts. MV sued immediately and the case dragged through the courts for years. Judges had a hard time making up their minds. Some sections of the press twaddled about captive audiences. The MV Corporation felt reasonably certain that the Supreme Court justices were sensible men, but with its very existence at stake, there was nerve-wracking suspense until the decision was made. National Earplug Associates, Inc. was found guilty of restraint of advertising, and earplugs were declared 
unconstitutional. Grandmother, who was visiting Fred and Mavis at the time, hit the ceiling. She exhausted herself and them with her tirades and swore that never, never, never would she give up her earplugs. MV's representatives in Washington soon were able to get Congress to put teeth into the Supreme Court's decision, and eventually, just as Fred and Mavis predicted, Grandmother joined the ridiculous band who went to jail for violating the law prohibiting the use or possession of earplugs. That was some skeleton for anybody, let alone an executive of MV, to have in his closet. Luckily, it had, up to now, remained in the closet, for at no time during her trial or afterwards did Grandmother mention having a relative who worked for the corporation. But they had been lulled into a false sense of security. They assumed that Grandmother would die before finishing her prison term, and that the problem of Grandmother was therefore solved. Now they were faced with it all over again. How were they going to keep her from shooting off her mouth before their, neighbor, their friends and neighbors? How persuade her? to go away and live in some distant spot. Mavis's day was not going well either. She felt uneasy, out of sorts, and in the lull between the breakfast commercials and the cleaning commercials, she tried to analyze her feelings. It must be grandmother. Perhaps it was true, as Fred said, that grandmother was a bad influence. It wasn't that she was right. Mavis believed in Fred because he was her husband and believed in the MV Corporation because it was the largest corporation in the entire United States. Nevertheless, it upset her when Fred and Grandmother argued, as they almost always did when they were together. Anyway, maybe this time Grandmother wouldn't be so troublesome. Maybe Jail had taught her how wrong it was to try and stand in the way of progress. On this hopeful note, her thinking ended, for the soap powder box cried out, Good morning, Mother! What say we go after those breakfast dishes and give our hands a beauty treatment at the same time? You know, Mother, no other soap gives you a beauty treatment while you wash your dishes. Only so glow, so glow, right there on your shelf, waiting to help you. So let's begin, shall we? While washing the dishes, Mavis was deciding what dessert to prepare. She'd bought several new ones the day before, and now they all sounded so good she couldn't make up her mind which to use first. The commercial for the canned apple pie ingredients was a little playlet about a husband coming home at the end of a long, hard day, smelling the apple pie, rushing out to the kitchen, sweeping his wife off her feet, kissing her, and saying, that's my girl. It sounded promising to Mavis, especially when the announcer said any housewife who got to work right this minute and prepared the apple pie could be almost certain of getting the same reaction from her husband. Then there was a cute jingle from the Devil's Food Cake Mix sung by a trio of girls' voices with a good swing band in the background. If she'd made the mistake of buying only one box, it said, she ought to go out and buy another before she started baking because one of these luscious Devil's Foods cakes would not be enough for her hungry family. It was peppy and made Mavis feel better. She checked herself and find she had only one box, jotted it down on her shopping list. Next, from the gingerbread mix box came a homey type of commercial that hit Mavis all wrong with its, mmm, yes, just like grandmother used to make. Well, I'm afraid my time here on Earth is coming to an end. Um, thank you for listening. And if you want to hear how that story ends and what... Uh, happens to grandmother, I do encourage you to pick up a copy of Rediscovery Science Fiction by Women um, and look for my story, Captive Audience. My name is Dora Singerson Shorter. I was born in Dublin in 1866, the daughter of Dr. George Singerson, a Gaelic scholar and poet, and Hester Singerson, a published novelist. My style is narrative verse, especially the ballad form, and many of my memorable poems blend Irish folklore with imaginative tension and refrain, leading Douglas Hyde, a former president of Ireland, to pronounce me the greatest storyteller in verse that Ireland has produced. After marrying Mr. Clement Shorter, he took me to England, but my heart's passion remained in Ireland. The 1916 Rising was launched by Irish Republicans against British rule with the aim of independence of the Irish Republic. This tormented me so much, my health began to fail, and I died on January 6, 1918, at the age of 52. I'll be reading from the Fairy Changeling and other poems, which was published in 1898. Wishes I wish we could live as the flowers live, to breathe and to bloom in the summer and sun, 
to slumber and sway in the heart of the night and to die when our glory had done. I wish we could love as a bee's love, to rest or to roam without sorrow or sight, with laughter when, after the war had won, love flew with a whispered goodbye. I wish we could die as the birds die, to fly and to fall when our beauty was best, no trammels of time on the years of our face, and to leave but an empty nest. The Old Maid She walks in a lonely garden On the path her feet have made With high-heeled shoes, gold-buckled And gown of a flowered brocade The hair that falls on her shoulders Half held with a ribbon tie Once glowed like the wheat in autumn Now grey as a winter sky Time on her brow with rough fingers Writes his record of smiles and tears and her mind like a golden timepiece, he stopped in the long past years. At the foot of the lonely garden, when she comes to the trysting place, she knew of the old where she lingered, with a blush on her withered face. The children out on the common, they climb to the garden wall, and laugh, he will come tomorrow, who never come at all. And often over our sewing, as mother and neighbors sit to gossip over the story that has never to an end. He is dead, I would say, that lover who left her so long ago. But my neighbor would rest her needle to answer, He's false, I know. For could it be he was sleeping with a love that was such as this, he'd have burst through the gates of silence and flown to meet her kiss. Is she best with tears or laughter, this dame in her old brocade, my neighbor says she is holy, with a faith that will not fade. But the children out on the common, they answer her dreary call, and say, He will come tomorrow, who never will come at all. The last poem I'm going to read is The Ballad of the Fairy Thorn Tree. This is an evil night to go, my sister, to the fairy tree across the fairy wrath, Will you not wait till Hollow's leave, eve is over, for many are dangers in your path? I may not wait till Hollow eve is over. I shall be there before the night is fled. For brother, I am weary for my lover, and I must see him once, alive or dead. I prayed to heaven, but it would not listen. I'll call thrice in the devil's name tonight. But it be a live man that shall come to hear me, or but a corpse, all clad in snowy white. She had drawn on her silken hose and garter. Her crimson petticoat was knilted high. She trod her way to the bog and brambles until the fairy tree she stood nearby. When she first cried, the devil's name so loudly she listened, but she heard no sound at all. When twice she cried, she thought out from the darkness she heard the echo of a light footfall. When last she cried out, her voice came in a whisper. She trembled in her loneliness and fright. Before her stood a shrouded mighty figure in somber garnets blacker than night. And if you be my own true love, she questioned, I fear you. Speak you quickly unto me. Oh, I am not your true love, it answered. He drifts without a grave upon the sea. If he be dead, then gladly will I follow down the black stairs of death into the grave. Your lover calls for you from a place to rest him from the internal tossing of the waves. I'll make my love a bed, both wide and hollow, a grave where we may both ever sleep. What gives you for his body fair and slender to draw it from the dangers of the deep? I'll give you both my silver comb and earrings. I'll give you my tre little treasure store. I will but take what living thing comes forward, the first to meet you passing to your door. Oh, may my little dog be the first to meet me, so loose my lover from your dreaded hold. What will you give me for the heart that loved you, the heart that I hold chained and frozen cold? My own betrothed ring I give you gladly, my ring of pearls and every one tear. I will but have what other living creature, that second in your pathway, shall appear. To buy this heart, to warm my love to living, I pray my pony meet me on return. And now, for his young soul, what will you give me, his soul that night and day doth fret and burn? You will not have my silver comb and earrings. You will not have my ring of precious stone. 
Oh, nothing have I left to promise you, but give my soul to buy him back his own. All woefully she wept and stepping homeward, bemoth alone in her dark place and cruel fate. Oh, come, she cried, my little dog to meet me, and you, my horse, to browsing at the gate. Right hastily she pushed by bush and bramble, chased by a fear that made her footsteps fleet. And as she ran to meet her little brother, then her old father coming to her meet. Oh, brother, little brother, cried she weeping. Well, you said of the fairy tree beware, for precious things are brought and sold ere midnight on hollow eve by those who barter there. She went alone into the little chapel, chapel and knelt before the holy virgin shrine, saying, Mother Mary, pray you for me to save those two most gentle souls of thine. And as she prayed, behold, the holy statue spoke to her, saying, Little can I aid, God's ways are just, and you have dared to question his judgment on his soul you bought and paid. For that one soul, your father and your brother, your own immortal life you bartered, then, yet what one chance is allowed, your sure repentance, give back his heart you made to live again. For these two souls, my father and my brother, I give his heart back into death's cold land, never again to warm his dead sweet body, or beat to madness under my hand. And for your soul, to save it from its sorrow, you must drive back his soul into the night, back into righteous punishment and justice, or lose your chance of everlasting light. Oh, never shall I ba drive him back to anguish, my soul shall suffer letting his go free. She rose weeping, left the little chapel, went forward blindly till she reached the sea. She dug a grave within the surf and shingle, a cold, dark bed made very deep and wide. She laid down all stiff and stretched for burial, right in the pathway of the rising tide. First tossed into her waiting arms the restless, loud waves, a woman very gray and cold. Within her bed she stood upright and loosened her fingers from the dead hand's hold. The second, who upon her heart had rested from out of the storm, a baby chilled and stark, with one long sob she drew it to her bosom, bosom then thrust it out again into the dark. The last who came so slow was her own lover. She kissed his icy face on the cheek and chin. O oh, cold shall be your house tonight, beloved. O oh, cold the bed that me, we must sleep within. And heavy, heavy on our lips so faithful, and on our hearts shall lie our own roof tree. And as she spoke, the bitter tears were falling on his still face, all saltier than the sea. And oh, she said, if for a little moment you knew my cold dead love that I was by, that my soul goes into the utter darkness when yours comes forth and mine goes in to die. And as she wept, she kissed his frozen forehead, laid her warm lips upon his mouth so chill, with no response, and then the waters flowed into their grave, grew heavy, deep and still. And so, tis said, if you go to that fairy thorn tree, you dare go, you see her ghost so lone. She prays for the love of hers, that you will aid her and give your soul to buy her back her own. Oh, I must depart from this mortal realm. So, but thank you very much for listening to my poems. And I hope that you will read more of my poems in the future. When the princess Melisande was born, her mother, the queen, wished to have a christening party, but the king put his foot down and said he would not have it. I've seen too much trouble come of christening parties, said he. However carefully you keep your visiting books, some fairy or other is sure to get left out, and you know what that leads to. Why, even in my own family, the most shocking things have occurred. The fairy Malevola was not asked to my great-grandmother's christening, and you know all about the spindle and the hundred years' sleep. Perhaps you're right, said the queen. My own cousin by marriage forgot some stuffy old fairy or other when she was sending out the cards for her daughter's christening, and the old wretch turned up at the last moment, and the girl drops toads out of her mouth to this day. Just so said the king. We'll have no nonsense about it. I'll be her godfather and you shall be her godmother and we won't ask a single fairy. Then none of them can be offended. Unless 
they all are, said the queen. And that was exactly what happened. When the king and the queen and the baby got back from the christening, the parlor maid met them at the door and said, Please, your majesty, several ladies have called. I told them you were not at home, but they all said they'd wait. Are they in the parlor? asked the queen. I've shown them into the throne room, your majesty, said the parlor maid. You see, there are several of them. There were about 700. The great throne room was crammed with fairies of all ages and of all degrees of beauty and ugliness. Good fairies and bad fairies, flower fairies and moon fairies, fairies like spiders and fairies like butterflies. And as the queen opened the door and began to say how sorry she was to have kept them waiting, they all cried with one voice, why didn't you ask me to your christening party? I haven't had a party, said the queen. And she turned to the king and whispered, I told you so. This was her only consolation. You've had a christening, said the fairies all together. I'm very sorry, said the poor queen. But Malevola pushed forward and said, hold your tongue most rudely. Malevola is the oldest, as well as the most wicked of the fairies. She is deservedly unpopular and has been left out of more christening parties than all the rest of the fairies put together. Don't begin to make excuses, she said, shaking her finger at the queen. That only makes your conduct worse. You know well enough what happens if a fairy is left out of a christening party. We are all going to give our christening presents now. And as the fairy of highest social position, I shall begin. The princess shall be bald. The queen nearly fainted as Malevola drew back. And another fairy, in a smart bonnet with snakes in it, stepped forward with a rustle of bat's wings. But the king stepped forward, too. No, you don't, said he. I wonder at you, ladies. I do indeed. How can you be so unfairy like Have none of you been to school? Have none of you studied the history of your own race? Surely you don't need a poor, ignorant king like me to tell you that this is no go. How dare you, cried the fairy in the bonnet and the snakes in it quivered as she tossed her head. It is my turn, and I say that the princess shall be... The king actually put his hand over her mouth. Look here, he said. I won't have it. Listen to reason, or you'll be sorry afterwards. A fairy who breaks the traditions of fairy history goes out, you know she does, like a, the flame of a candle. And all tradition shows that only one bad fairy is ever forgotten at a christening party, and the good ones are always invited. So, either this is not a christening party, or else you were all invited except one, and by her own showing, that was Malevola. It nearly always is. Do I make myself clear? Several of the better class fairies who had been led away by Malevola's influence murmured that there was something in what his majesty said. Try it if you don't believe me, said the king. Give your nasty gifts to my innocent child. But as sure as you do, out you go like a candle flame. Now then, will you risk it? No one answered, and presently several fairies came up to the queen and said what a pleasant party it had been, but they really must be going. This example decided the rest. One by one, all the fairies said goodbye and thanked the queen for the delightful afternoon they had spent with her. It's been quite too lovely, said the lady with the snake bonnet. Do ask us again soon, dear queen. I shall be so longing to see you again and the dear baby. And off she went. Off she went with the snake trimming quivering more than ever. When the very last fairy was gone, the queen ran to look at the baby. She tore off its Honiton lace cap and 
burst into tears for all the baby's downy golden hair came off with the cap and the princess Melisande was as bald as an egg. Don't cry, my love, said the king. I have a wish lying by, which I've never had occasion to use. My fairy godmother gave it to me for a wedding present, but since then I've had nothing to wish for. <laughs> Thank you, dear, said the queen, smiling through her tears. I'll keep the wish till the baby grows up, the king went on, and then I'll give it to her, and if she likes to wish for hair, she can. Oh, won't you wish for it now, said the queen, dropping mixed tears and kisses on the baby's round, smooth head. No, dearest, she may want something else more when she grows up, and besides, her hair may grow by itself. But it never did. Now, when she was grown up, the queen said to the king, My love, our dear daughter is old enough to know what she wants. Let her have the wish. So the king wrote to his fairy godmother and sent the letter by a butterfly. He asked if he might hand on to his daughter the wish the fairy had given for a wedding present. I have never had occasion to use it, said he, though it has always made me happy to remember that I had such a thing in the house. The wish is as good as new, and my daughter is now of an age to appreciate so valuable a present. To which the fairy replied by return of butterfly, Dear King, pray do whatever you like with my poor little present. I had quite forgotten about it, but I'm pleased to think that you have treasured my humble keepsake all these years. Your affectionate godmother, Fortuna F. So the king unlocked his gold safe with the seven diamond-handled keys that hung at his girdle and took out the wish and gave it to his daughter. And if you wish to find out how that all worked out for them, you'll have to look up a book in your library or find it on Project Gutenberg and find out. <laughs>